So welcome along to the next episode of the Eye Photography Podcast. Um, if you're watching this on YouTube, you'll see that I'm joined by Emily. If you're not, Emily, give us a shout. Hello, it's very, very good to be back. Super, and it's lovely to have you back on. So today, the reason why I thought you'd be the perfect candidate uh, for this episode is that we're going to talk about cameras, and you are the queen of tech. That, that is... <laughs> Your new title with the crown, DSLR or mirrorless that. shaped. <laughs> yeah, I am uh, happy with that. I shall be the mirrorless queen. The mirrorless queen. <laughs> <laughs> Sounds like a song that Abba should have wrote instead of Dancing Queen. Mirrorless queen. <laughs> I, I haven't even thought of any more lyrics, so I won't continue with that. But what a lovely start to the podcast. Um, yeah. So yeah, we are talking about that mirrorless uh, v DSLR. This is kind of the debate. It's it's um. It's kind of one of those age old, well, I say age old in, in the kind of recent years of uh, photography, a big kind of question that people ask themselves when they're buying a camera. What do I buy? Do I buy DSLR? Do I buy mirrorless? Um, I mean, it, it's different for each person, but there's certainly a rise for the kind of mirrorless market now, isn't there? Yeah, I think um, when I certainly started getting into photography, mirrorless was very much in its its infancy. And there were more cons back in the day, you know, it used to be they were more fragile or, or they, they had terrible battery life. Whereas now we're looking at sort of like several generations down the road of mirrorless. I think uh, the gap is narrowing and some people, including myself, might argue that mirrorless is the way to go. <laughs> well, I, I would I would agree. I mean, I, I have to kind of put my... Um... I'll have to kind of try and help the people that are interested in the DSLRs and explain the pros and cons and the benefits to it really. But yeah, I mean, personally, I, I've got a mirrorless. I'll put my hands up in the spirit of honesty. I have used DSLRs a lot in the past and moved to mirrorless because of some benefits that uh, I'm sure Emily will kind of uh, talk about in a little while. But um, I think there's to say there's pros and cons to both really. So we thought that this could be a useful little conversation to have for people that are you know just stuck really in between not knowing what the best options are because I think there are kind of benefits for people using a DSLR depending upon what type of photography that they do and same for mirrorless really isn't there really. So um, we'll kind of once I make it as a debate we're not trying to kind of challenge each other necessarily because I think we both we both do love mirrorless cameras <laughs> um but yeah we'll, we'll kind of have a, a wee chat about them really but I mean as you said you know that the market for mirrorless is is getting bigger and, and better really and I think I actually read very recently as much as Canon is still the pretty much the market leader um the the DSLR market itself is starting to shrink. And I believe mirrorless um, and the companies like Sony, um, who pretty much just do mirrorless cameras these days, don't they? Um, that They are getting more popular than the, the old, old steads like Nikon, aren't they? I don't know if you've seen that recently. Yeah, for sure. I think um, in the photography community in general, there's definitely been a shift towards wanting a camera that will do very, very good video as well as for photography. And mirrorless definitely has the edge over DSLRs when it comes to video performance. And if you can get a camera that does both for basically the same price, eh, why not? Well, yeah, you, that's it. it. You never necessarily know if you're going to want to use that camera for video but the fact that you've got the option there as you said um, photographers these days are not just photographers in some instances if you're if you're like yourself you're running your own business you're you know you're content creating I suppose is the, is the phrase these days you're making video you, you're making kind of um, loads of different types of kind of pieces of information for websites and for marketing etc so to have a camera that does everything um, I mean you see, obviously, there's this, you know, it's fairly standard these days to have a camera that has, you know, 1080p, you know, high definition filming quality. But do you find as a business owner, as a videographer and wedding photographer, that that's kind of the, you know, the, the level you don't really want to go at? You really want to be looking more towards 4K and, and even 8K? Well, it, it all depends on how you want to edit it. Um, the benefit of using 4K is you can crop in. A hell of a lot because you have much more data and more megapixels to work with so if you're like me and you shoot your videos a little bit wonky or you want to punch <laughs> in on someone uh, and, and get a close-up with only one camera if you're shooting in 4k or 8k uh, i shoot in 4k primarily um you can effectively use several different angles just using one camera because you can zoom in without losing any resolution whereas with hd because people are going to be watching it in HD, every time you mess with that frame, you are going to start losing quality. 
Yeah, uh, yeah, I suppose it would it would be the same on the stills front as well. Yeah, if you if you've got your image kind of at full res and your full raw, anytime you're zooming in, even if it's a small amount, there is going to be a degradation in quality, really. But in, in terms of the, the mirrorless market, I suppose that, let's kind of look at it from that perspective. What's kind of a a standard amount of megapixels. I know we shouldn't really get lost in the myth of megapixels necessarily, and you'll be the first to say it doesn't necessarily matter. But for people that are starting out, um, you know, who who not really know, know where to turn somewhat, what's what's kind of a comfortable level of, you know, this many megapixels will do the job for pretty much most of what you're going to do. So, so with the cameras I have, my a lot of my micro four thirds cameras are sixteen megapixels. Which sometimes, when you see, you know, you have a hundred megapixels on a phone mm. or whatever, some people think that sixteen isn't enough. But when you think that like HD is is two megapixels and four K is eight megapixels, you know, people aren't going to be looking on screens more than four K, so you can crop in a lot. Yeah. In order to, you still get loads out of the sixteen megapixel. My other cameras, um, my two full frame ones and my other micro four thirds are 20 megapixels and 24. Mm. I don't have anything higher than 24 in, in my lineup. How about you? I, I think I'm the same. My Sony, which again is on an APS-C sensor, um, is 24. I, I think it's like marketed as 24.3, but, you know, mm. effectively 24. But yeah, again, I've never found a scenario where I'm like, ah, oh, if only it was sharper. And, but that's necessarily, to, or, you know, I'm allowed to kind of make it bigger. But obviously, providing I've shot it correctly and everything, then, then yeah, I've got an image as clear as I want. Because the majority of my images nowadays, I find, go online. They go onto my websites or my blogs or whatever. And as you've totally rightly said, um, it didn't hit me till kind of oh, quite a while ago when I actually read it or I remember I worked it out that when you're uploading an image to Instagram, so their um, the kind of post size, um, one optimized size is 1080 by 1080 pixels, um, which works out to be two megapixels. And that is all you're ever going to get. So you're right, say having 24, 50, whatever, a million megapixels on a camera, it's never going to be seen more than two megapixels depending upon where you upload it. So yeah, I think we may have gone slightly off on a tangent there to say, but really don't get yourself kind of lost in, in that kind of uh, that myth that more means better. Um, it does have benefits, obviously, when you come maybe to like printing, but if you're not going to do that, if you're just really using it for sharing and, and, and kind of uploading, then yeah, I, I, I wouldn't even look at it. I'd look at other kind of uh, more important aspects. And I think the same goes with, with DSLR cameras. I, I think, again, they're very similar. They seem to keep a similar market between the two of them as to what a DSLR, you know, what the kind of the current range is in terms of megapixels tends to be somewhat similar. I think that there starts to be differences when it comes to form factor. Well, that's that quite a, a big yeah that's a big thing isn't it i mean what what what's the benefit do you find with mirrorless you know what what's what's the biggest differences between mirrorless and dslr when it comes to like form factor for you so when i was i was looking to go from like my bridge cameras into getting a first proper camera which was a, a sony uh, back in the day um i had this conversation with someone I knew and the dslr i think is designed to be not very user friendly I feel like the very old school in the way that they're laid out and the menus are all like, you have to do this course and you have to do this and you have to know about all <laughs> this in order to use it. Whereas mirrorless came out and basically just went, we'll give you all of the Wi-Fi features, we'll give you apps, we'll give you usability, we'll give you all the things that you want. And it still has amazing image quality. So I, I think for me, I'm not a purist. If the camera can do something for me and I don't have to sit there for 10 minutes and figure it out, I'm all for that. And I think the joy of photography isn't about sitting down with a textbook and learning all the boring stuff. It's about getting out there and being creative. Oh, and yeah. for me, mirrorless really, because it's more user-friendly, user uh, using your electronic viewfinder, you get a lot more data before you take the shot. Uh, I just think it's it's much, much easier to hit the ground running with a mirrorless camera, in my opinion. Yeah, yeah. I, I think, yeah, for anyone that is starting out, you're right. It's it's not as cumbersome. Uh, they're not necessarily as heavy. I mean, you can still get light DSLRs, but the the problem kind of thing with photographers, this is just is, as a whole, not necessarily if you're just a mirrorless photographer or not, that you'll end up wanting to get more lenses, a battery grip, this, that, and the other, and you add more weight to it. So if you've got a camera that's a little bit heavier to begin with, a bit chunkier, and you're going to add bigger things to it, 
you're just giving yourself potentially a problem of lugging around a really heavy bag that I actually went to see my dad recently and he's kind of briefly, briefly, very early started up um, photography. And so he's got like a small DSLR and he's put it in a camera bag and he gave it to me and I opened it up and there's so many little holes in the compartments. I'm like, oh my God, we need to kind of fill it up here and here and there. And that's, I think that's supposed, that's just my mindset of like, we need to fill it up because there's empty gaps. And I gave him my bag and I got, he almost swore at me because of how heavy it was. And even though my camera bag is just a mirrorless camera, camera with a few lenses you add so many more things to it and I thought if I did have a really big DSLR in there a big kind of chunky 1DX or something like that then I probably wouldn't be able to carry it and I probably would just turn off and go uh, you know, I'm not going to bother picking it up today because I'm just not going to be carrying something like that around in hot weather. Um, but I, I see I see the trend of how it went, because if you look at things like uh, DSLR cameras uh, and other technologies like computers and, and phones and such, I mean, they started off um, at a certain size, you know, respectively, but then you know, incrementally over the kind of the late 90s, early 2000s, everything got bigger. You know, the cameras got bigger, the screens got bigger, computers got bigger, and bigger was better, really, for a lot of people. And then there was this shift. Uh, you see it in the iPhones. Everything became a bit smaller and more compact and more slimline. And I, I see this as where mirrorless is really kind of capitalized in the market because their form factor is, is a lot smaller. You can stick it in your pocket, stick it in your bag. You don't need to go and have an old big camera bag, you know, dedicated and made for your DSLR. Um, so I think that's possibly where it's been quite beneficial in that instances. But I think there, there will still be kind of a, a range of people who like that, um, that reliability and comfort of a big chunky camera. I don't yeah. know whether whether it's just like, you know, I look at my phone and thinking, yeah, it, it's it'll take pictures. It's not going to take the world's greatest photographs because I, I know the technology inside is not as good as, as others. Um, and I can see how maybe people would look at, you know, a small camera, say like a, you know, a, a small Pentax or a Sony, and then compare it to maybe like a big DSLR Sony with a battery grip. As much as it may do the exact same things, you may look at the bigger one and go, well, it feels a little bit more comfortable, maybe a bit more robust. But I mean, I think they're, they're pretty similar, though, as well. I, I don't necessarily see mirrorless cameras as being fragile, do you? Oh, definitely not. And there are massive mirrorless cameras. I have um, a Lumix S1, which is, is the size of a decent Canon. And then the S5, which is basically the same camera, but smaller because... I realized that it was too chunky for me and I wanted the, the tinier one. But my <laughs> business partner is moving over to uh, Lumix Mirrorless this year. And he was having this exact debate. We were looking at the S1, which is massive, <laughs> and the S5, which is uh, exactly the same in spec, more or less, but just like a traditional mirrorless camera, much smaller. Yeah. And his argument was that because he has bigger hands, he would rather have uh, the, the, the larger form factor and, and have... Um, the dials and everything be a bit more easily accessible but they're still both mirrorless cameras and they both do exactly the same thing yeah so if you are looking at mirrorless you could look at um the tiniest things in the world from the pentax q to uh the lumix uh, micro four thirds cameras and the olympus cameras and then when we get to like the full frame versions you do also have massive camera bodies as well so yeah. uh, form factor generally is smaller but there is a wide uh, range it's more down to uh, the features and and how they perform I think more than form factor nowadays yeah yeah I, th I think you're right there is and there's always the op option to to add grips to them as well I see a lot of third-party companies mm -hmm. they sell like grips that you can kind of bolt onto your camera so if you've got big chunky hands then yeah and you feel a little bit more oh, I feel things a bit more comfortable like that you, you can add to it really without you know adding too much weight but um lenses is the other thing I wanted to talk about and um, the range uh, and selection of lenses for DSLR and mirrorless I find some people say that there is a little bit more choice when it comes to DSLR but at the same time, very recently, I've noticed Canon have started to discontinue um, quite a few um, lenses that they've got available for DSLR. And I started to wonder whether the rise of adapters, uh, lens mount adapters have been you know, party to that, that now with mirrorless, I see that you can pretty much almost use any lens on any camera, providing you've got like the right mount. I mean, have you used anything like that? Oh, I have adapters all over the place when i first <laughs> bought uh, the original the og sony um 
the what, what was, what's the Sony range? The A one is that um, the first one? There's the there's the A the Alpha series, yes. and then and when the lenses start going up, they go to a G the series. The A seven was that yes. the first one? Yes, yes God, it was. I'm going back in time. When I bought <laughs> that, it actually came with a Canon adapter because they said at that point, you know, there's about three mirrorless lenses on the market, so we'll just ship it with an adapter. And recently, when I got my Lumix full frame, that came with a Canon adapter as well. Um, but the, the benefit of, of not having the mirror in place, it does make adapting lenses very, very easy. You can do it on your micro four thirds and your APS-Cs as well. Um, it, it's great. I have so many old vintage lenses like the Canon FDs and some Pentax lenses and some, oh, I've got too many lenses. <laughs> <laughs> no, but it, you, you're so right. It, I think that's the joy of it, really, that you don't have to then go, all right, I've got to stick to my, you know, my Lumix uh, camera lenses or, you know, whatever brand that you've got, because you can literally almost, it's like kind of step up rings now with filters that you can pretty much use any filter because you've got an adapter to fit to it. So you could borrow off your friends, but also it's effectively, you're kind of, you know, if you can borrow a lens off somebody, you're just buying the adapter to, to fit for it, which is, I say they're super cheap, depending on where you go for them, because you can get ones that run uh, a lot of electricals, can't you? So um, if you get the right ones, they'll actually you'll still be able to automatically change your aperture and and, and bits and pieces. Um, but some don't have that electrical connections, and you just still have to use by uh, manual focus, don't you? For sure. Um, the in my experience, the the ones that say that they'll do autofocus don't the, the adapters mm. so if you do adapt your lenses do assume that you'll be using manual focus but yeah. one of the benefits of having a mirrorless camera is live focus peaking Ooh. because you're getting a, a live continuous feed from the lens and the sensor you're seeing exactly what the sensor is is seeing in real time mm -hmm. so things like focus peaking and, and changing um the exposure in your aperture you can see exactly how it's going to affect the image as you're messing around with stuff mm -hmm. whereas with your optical viewfinders on a dslr you could look through and all you're seeing is what the lens sees, not what the camera sees. So your settings could be completely wrong, yeah. but you're looking through the set, you're looking through the lens and you can see how it should look. Yeah. But you don't get the live feedback. Oh, and, I've, and, sorry, yeah, carry on. No, I, I was going to say, I've, I spent many a years mm -hmm. taking photographs and I, and I feel this is where the, the phrase of it is, uh, chimping comes yeah. from. Because with DSLR cameras, you're totally right. You take the shot. You don't know if you've got it um, because, as you say, you don't know if your settings are all correct. It's kind of like shooting on film in a way. Mm -hmm. But then you look straight back at the screen and go, yeah, I've got it. Or no, I haven't. And then you change it again. But by that time, your moment may have gone where I think that's certainly where the mirrorless uh, has a big benefit is that the, the EVF, the electronic viewfinder, shows you exactly what it's going to be and if you make changes whilst you're looking through that viewfinder or looking on the screen um you'll see the changes live and i, I think that's that's a good educational way isn't it of understanding what all your exposure tools do and, and other bits and pieces I, I think it's a good way to learn isn't it i think so and i think it takes a lot of the frustration out of things when you're first starting out and it's not just about seeing the photo. You can add so much more information. Like I have a live histogram in, in my, my screen or my eyepiece. You can see the audio levels if you shoot in video. Mm -hmm. you, can, you can shoot in black and white and see black and white real time. Yeah. You know, there's so many wonderful benefits to the EVF. So some purists and, and certainly people that have come from film uh, backgrounds with your optical viewfinders. The downside of your EVF is it will never look as clear as real life because with an optical viewfinder you're literally looking through the lens in real life whereas with your EVF you're looking at a tiny little screen. These have improved exponentially over the years and as you get used to them quicker than you think would you agree with that? Oh definitely I mean if you've if you've never used the camera before um, and you've maybe only ever used your phone. Again, phones are somewhat similar. They, they kind of have that kind of live reaction to, to any changes that you make. But a lot of the time, you pretty much just shoot on auto with, with most phones. So um, I think, yeah, if it's just like your first introduction to cameras and you're going into mirrorless, um, yeah, it's so easy because you don't know anything else. I think if you change, if you go from DSLR to mirrorless or vice versa, the, the change can be a big jump to getting used to. And you can sometimes forget that what you're seeing through uh, an OVF, which we, we call an optical viewfinder, um, you can kind of sometimes get confused or forget that 
you, what you're actually seeing isn't going to be the final photograph. Um, I have a feeling, I may be wrong, and I hope to be proved wrong necessarily, um, that there is maybe a benefit with the DSLRs in the OVF compared to EVF market, is that because obviously you're using more electricals to, to kind of power the camera and to, to provide this viewfinder, um, the battery lives will be better on the DSLRs because they're not using up as much power to, to, to kind of use those functions as well. Is, is that the case? Very true. Um, shooting weddings with a, a Nikon shooter over the last few years. <laughs> and when we were going, say, from the morning to the, 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 the venue or to wherever, he would literally just leave his camera on in the boot. He's like, that's fine. I, like it won't go down at all and I'm here like must save battery life must turn it off every 10 minutes and I I, I genuinely for my for my, my main camera when I shoot weddings I have five batteries my backup camera I have three batteries he was just like yeah I've got one in the tank that's fine that'll probably do me the next three weddings <laughs> <laughs> yeah when I have to recharge this for a few weeks <laughs> yeah honestly it is a big difference but then you, you use any electricity to have all these extra cool features which he doesn't mm. have so uh. <laughs> <laughs> i love your professionalism between you and uh. your partner <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, yeah you're, you're, you're so right i've i've noticed i think i think with my sony again depending upon obviously things like you know burst mode and other features that you're using you can use power up quicker than others but you maybe get around about 300 350 shots per battery whereas you go to a DSLR, you could probably be talking about double, maybe 650 to 700, something like that. So yeah, I think that has um, an impact depending upon where you're going. You know, if you if you don't want to carry a lot of stuff, I know we talked about how mirrorless is a bit smaller and a little bit lighter, um, but the downside, like Emily said, is that you may end up having multiple batteries and as, even though they're small, you know, you add, you know, five or six to your bag, and it's almost like having another lens in there already. So I think there is, if, if they can improve the battery life, um, you know, the technology behind it or whatever, or reduce the power consumption that, that mirrorless cameras are like, I think they will, they'll pretty much eat up DSLRs um, in terms of their popularity because they're starting to get there anyway. I've certainly noticed that battery power has, got, has gotten better and I, I can't see it ever going backwards because everybody now seems to want to live on wireless, you know, um, phones, computers, cars, everything's wireless these days. So I can't see how battery life uh, is something that's just going to get forgotten in the camera world is it and super fancy new feature in my newest cameras they're all usb-c so you can literally stick a power bank on the hot shoe and have it run indefinitely yes oh there you it's go so cool and they're <laughs> so cheap as they are you can get you know like ten thousand milliamps uh battery packs for for next to nothing really and yeah you could have maybe one or two of those in your camera and it can recharge it a couple of times over so yeah you can kind of uh stick your fingers up to all your dsr friends yep. <laughs> and say nah, nah, <laughs> i've now got extra power and i'm not kind of like stuck into having to stand next to all the uh, the power sockets really but but i think that was a really good kind of uh kind of good comparison Comparison really between you know mirrorless and DSLR cameras because there's there's benefits to each, um, but I think the rise uh, and popularity of mirrorless cameras shows there is maybe probably more benefits I'd say to a to a new photographer uh, and for someone who's maybe looking to change things up maybe doesn't want to be carrying around so much kit. Um, and be laden down with all that that kind of heavy equipment. Um, but I mean, if, again, maybe to take this one step further a little bit. Is there any particular um, mirrorless cameras that, if, again, if somebody was just looking for advice, any particular models on makes, Emily, that you would recommend? So it really depends on what you're looking for. If you're looking for something that's very compact, I would definitely recommend the Micro Four Thirds cameras, so your Olympus or your Lumix, because while the camera bodies can be very small if you're buying a full frame mirrorless you're still stuck with usually quite massive lenses if you get a smaller sensor you will get smaller lenses so for when i'm on on, on my holidays and i'm mooching around or if i just get on the train and go to liverpool or whatever i will take my micro four thirds cameras because not only the body is tiny but the lenses are tiny as well yeah. if you're if you're looking for a full frame sort of dslr experience but in a mirrorless version then you would be looking at your sony's or your lumix yeah brilliant brilliant and i think on the dslr side 
again, depending upon what you're looking for, but if, if you're talking entry level, um, you really, you, you'd probably be looking at your, uh, your Nikons and your Canons because they've been around for so many years. They know what they're doing. Um, sometimes it looks like they don't and they're making things so overly complicated that it just isn't necessary. But I think half of that's down to marketing somewhat. Um, but for, for the likes of Nikon, I can speak because I bought them previously and Nikon D, I think it's 3,500, um, is a good start in size. It's, it's not massive, um, but it gives you the DSLR experience and, you know, you've got the ability to add lenses and, and change them, et cetera. On the flip side on Canon, I would say something maybe around about the Canon 250D. I think there was another one, maybe, I don't even know if it's out anymore. They had like a 500 or 550D that was quite good a few years ago. Um, but I mean, this is like a shifting sand. This is like the, the problem we're talking about cameras so much that we could release this uh, this podcast and in 12 months, like the cameras we've talked about may not even exist. So I think just talking about the functions and the, the features you should be looking for um, are, are the most important things with whatever camera brand because brand to brand all right, there's maybe some slight subtle differences but on the whole they tend to be pretty similar would you say yeah i think when when one thing to note going back to our dslrs is is check the age of the camera hmm. because people might think as long as they get a full frame camera they will be amazing in low light and they'll have all of the features but if you're buying a camera with an older sensor uh, the technology just wasn't as good like I've used older Canons in the past and sometimes those are, are not as good in low light as as more modern cameras so yeah. don't if, if you if you absolutely want a full frame don't get one that's donkey's years old <laughs> yeah yeah I know you're so right I do look at sometimes like the mm. I'll say the chipset or the, the processor of what's running that sensor uh, uh, and see the age of it definitely um, but there we go. Well, thank you very much for that, Emily. It's been a really, really kind of good little uh, good, good debate and discussion. And hopefully we've provided with you some little ideas and kind of things to think about and to have a look at if you are at that kind of juncture of not sure whether you want to go to mirrorless or DSLR or you just haven't got a clue what camera to buy and you're just starting out. Um, but, you know, if you are at that kind of point that you are trying to make that decision and you've got any other thoughts that you think you can kind of contribute to this, then get in touch with us because we'd love to kind of hear your thoughts and your experiences if you've moved from uh, DSLR to mirrorless or, or you know, APS-C to full frame or vice versa. And we, we'd love to kind of know why people make these changes, what kind of runs the market, et cetera, because it's, it's interesting to see the sands of change. But you can get in touch with us on all the social medias. Uh, we've got our own email address. You can get in contact with us at tutor at iPhotographyCourse.com. Um, if you've been enjoying these podcasts or if you're watching it on YouTube, then please, please, please subscribe and follow. Um, it really, really helps us out. That'd be greatly appreciated. And myself and Emily will be back in another episode soon, shouldn't we? Absolutely, yeah. I could talk about cameras all day. <laughs> <laughs> Brilliant. Well, thank you very much for listening. Uh, it's bye from us and we'll see you soon.